Welcome to Stuff You Should Know from HowStuffWorks.com. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark, and there's Charles W. Chuck Bright, and there's Jerry over there, and this is Stuff You Should Know about Smoking Hitler. <laughs> Smoking Hitler? Blah, blah. <laughs> well, you know what's funny? Is, uh, Tell me I, what's funny about assassinating <laughs> Well, I, I uh, got this idea because I had listened to the recent Friendly Fire podcast episode on Valkyrie. Boy, you're just going all out on Friendly Fire, aren't you? No, I like it. Okay. It's a good show. Sure it is. Um, and there aren't many people that know more about history than John Roderick. Like, yeah. it's really impressive to hear that guy go off, like, from the dome. No, I know. He's got quite a brain. And, hey— Ben Harrison's no slouch either. Nah, he's sl- a little bit of a slouch. <laughs> he's listening to this, so <laughs> I got to rib him. Yeah. But uh, John, at one point in the show, was like, I can't like this. You'll see in the show, it's such a convoluted plan to blow up Hitler. Mm-hmm. And he's just like, I can't believe in all those years they couldn't get one one person to walk up and shoot him in the head. I saw that, too, um, in a couple of places. And, and it, it, it is very vexing and perplexing that yeah. not one person said and, and apparently people agreed to suicide missions a lot of people wanted to kill him but per- they, personally wanted they, to kill they him. just didn't go i, I know they didn't go <laughs> <laughs> what sound does it like a luger make i don't even know i don't know crack i can tell you what a dying <laughs> german sounds like when they're falling <laughs> off a building oh is that the wilhelm scream yeah. <laughs> well we wouldn't put the right one in anyway so no. <laughs> Never uh, forget. <laughs> yeah, anyway, it just seems odd to me that because there were, I think, 15 or 16 total plots uh-huh. to assassinate Hitler. Yeah. And I don't know if there wasn't a single one that was like, you take a gun, walk up behind him at his desk mm-hmm. and shoot him yeah. in the head. And then shoot yourself because it's going to go really badly for you, right? Yeah, I mean, they were all suicide missions mostly. Well, not all of them, apparently. Well, that's true. So, um I was surprised because I didn't realize, I think I'd heard like, you know, people had wanted to assassinate Hitler or something like that. I didn't realize that Hitler was about as charmed a human being as far as surviving assassination attempts goes as yeah. they come. Um, just didn't realize that. Would you say like maybe 15, 16 I think plus? 15 plus this one. Okay. Um, and I mean like there were close calls, like somewhere, you know, he just missed the, his assassination <clears throat> by a couple minutes. Mm-hmm. Or a bomb didn't go off, even though it was fully functioning and should have, and blown his plane yeah, out of the sky. That's the the Contro bottle or mm-hmm. whatever. Yeah. yeah. So there, the, it's not like he he went on as their Fuhrer for lack of trying. It just didn't happen for some reason. Yeah. But the the assassination attempt that that most people think of when they think of attempts to assassinate Hitler, especially if you're a fan of Tom Cruise. <laughs> Especially if you're a fan of Tom Cruise dressed as a pirate, yeah, um, is uh, the 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 Operation Valkyrie that we're about to talk about. Yeah, I watched that again today. What would you think of this time around? It's good. I like it. I like the cruise. It's the accent thing's weird, but you just got to get past it. He, uh, I saw there was like a pretty big outcry from Germans when he was cast when it was announced that he was going to play Klaus von Stauffenberg. Yeah. Because Klaus von Stauffenberg, as we'll see, is a national hero of Germany. And Germany does not take kindly to Scientology. I know. It's all a weird so, mixed bag. <laughs> yeah, they were not really happy when Tom Cruise is cast to play their national hero. Yeah. They said, Entschuldigung, Herr Cruise. <laughs> that was great. Thanks. So July 20th, 1944. Yes. Like, do you want to do the whole plan right here? Like, we're working this out right now. Okay, right all right, now. all right. <laughs> New 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 plan. Or just like what happened. I've got it. I've got it. Okay. We're going to take a totally different tack. You ready? <laughs> All right. Okay. So this Operation Valkyrie that we're talking about, it, it took place. It was a, a called the July 20th plot mm-hmm. is what it's called. But the operation was actually something larger than that. Yes. And as we'll see, it entailed a lot of people. And these were like high-ranking military officials. Some of the highest um, military uh, officials in the German military, the Wehrmacht, are you saying that right? Sure. Were involved in a plot to assassinate Hitler. Right. And uh, Ed put this together for us, and he points out, like, there are a lot of reasons people had to want to assassinate Hitler. There was people who said, you know, 
uh, we're, what we're doing with the the extermination of the Jews and other people is is like completely unconscionable, and this needs to ha- have an end put to it. I think that was mostly Kenneth Branagh, right? If we're going movie style, okay. Um, like in real life, though, he supposedly was the one that Kenneth like, Branagh, yeah, had the true conscience of what they were doing was wrong. Who who did he play? Tres Trescal. Uh, he's got. It's a tough one. Henning von Treschkow, Tres, T R E S C K O W. I'm pretty sure I got that right. That that was the Kenneth Branagh character, and he genuinely was opposed to how they were doing things. Right. Okay. So um, there was at least one person who felt that way, but he was very much in the minority. Yeah. There were another group of people who thought, well, you know, the, these Nazis, they're kind of upstarts. They're like nouveau riche, politically speaking. Yeah. Um, and they don't really care about the old guard. Well, I'm part of the old guard. My family is landed gentry in Germany. We have a nice tradition going back hundreds of years, and now these Nazi upstarts are moving my family out of power. We're no longer in the elite, and I don't like that. That's another reason why people want to get rid yeah, of Hitler. Yeah, and I think they were like the the majority of the people in this plot were those people. Okay. Like they weren't idealist democratic people who wanted like they, they were just trying to protect their heritage. Right. Some of them were anti-fascists. Not all of them. Yeah. But then there was definitely a through line that a lot of people bought into and may have even been a major motivator for a lot of people, too. Um, By the time July 20th, 1944 rolled around, it was very clear to most people Mm -hmm. uh, inside of Germany and out who were paying attention and who knew everything that Germany could not win World War II any longer. Yeah. After Normandy, it was dead. Exactly. Dead in the water. Yeah. Um, Once we made it to Normandy— it was it was over. Yeah. And not only had we made it to Normandy by this time, but we, we had supplies coming in. We had more and more troops coming in. We were overrunning Europe now. Yeah. Europe was, was ours. Plus, the Russians were moving their way westward from mm-hmm. the east. Not a good position for Germany to be in between the Allies and the Russians. Yeah. Um, Italy, Mussolini had been overthrown. Mm-hmm. So Italy was now this soft underbelly, as Winston Churchill put it, that could be attacked from Africa. Was he gone by this time? He was a puppet dictator in the northern part of Italy that okay. was protected by Germany. Because in the movie, most of Italy was gone. <laughs> the movie may be wrong, but in the movie, they were like Mussolini's coming for lunch or whatever. Yeah, that's true. Okay, but he had lost most of Italy by this time. All right, gotcha. But that left Italy exposed to attack from Africa, and Africa had just recently been lost by Rommel. Yeah. So Germany was in no position to win World War II. Yeah. So there were a lot of people, high-ranking officials in the military, who said, okay, before they actually make their way into Germany, Mm -hmm. that's a point of no return. Maybe we can get rid of Hitler and negotiate a peace that that keeps our republic intact. Yeah, and supposedly had even spoken to some of the allied leaders— Like, hey, let's just say Hitler was not around. <laughs> just, just hypothetically. <laughs> what would speak. that look like for uh, for the rest of us? Right. Like, how could we come out of this? Okay. Yeah. Uh, no one knows truly how. I don't know how far down the road those talks went, but it, it had been mentioned. So, the, supposedly, their point of contact was Alan Dulles, one of the Dulles brothers, who uh, would later overthrow the the. Um, government of Guatemala, among other things, is CIA director. The airport, Dulles? Yeah. Interesting. Same Dulles as, but that's who they were talking to. He was like the CIA or the OSS station chief of Switzerland uh-huh. at the time. But I think the Germans were like, okay, we will do this and we'll get rid of Hitler and we want to remain, you know, keep Germany intact. But the Russians cannot be part of the, the peace talks. Mm-hmm. We've done some things that they're not very happy about and they can't be part of it. And the allies wouldn't wouldn't take that off of the table. Yeah, because if the Russians were in there negotiating, it would be a much different story right. for Germany. So all of these guys knew that Germany could not win the war. Hitler, who was running the show still, had very different ideas. His yeah. idea of fighting this war was, we're going to fight this war until the very last German is killed. Yeah, Every man, woman, child who can pick up a gun is going to fight to the death against these invaders of our homeland and and I'm totally out of my mind and I'm taking the whole country down with me. Yeah, and in the in the Valkyrie film they even say like, you know, with uh, Normandy going on and what's happened there and he's just sort of like, well, I don't know what you're talking about. Everything's going great. Right. Give me some more crystal meth. 
Did he do that? That's the legend. Really? That that crystal meth was invented by Nazi scientists and that, oh, that right. upper echelon Nazis were all into that big time. Man, there's so many like – of all the people in history – like so many things that are horrific and true, and then so many weird stories. Yeah, from like Nazi treasure hunting to crystal meth addiction. Right, it's just crazy. I read a really interesting New Yorker article about people who treasure hunt for Nazi treasures in Poland, in the mountains of Poland. And the thing that gives gravity to these claims is that there really are enormous tunnels mm -hmm. in the mountains in Poland that you could fit trainfuls of gold in. Right, and um. They think that they, they actually might have something to them. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Even though that's supposedly a hoax, the Nazi gold thing? Supposedly, but right. again, they have these tunnel networks that are like really there. It's not like they're er, the tunnels themselves are urban legend. Right. It's just these tunnel networks are so expansive that no one's ever mapped them all. Gotcha. But they do exist. So there may be a gold-rich wing that no one's ever found. Yeah. Interesting. So, uh, wow, that was a lot. Do you want to take a break and then get into it tomorrow? Are you ready to keep plugging along? No, man. Let's uh, let's talk about killing Hitler right after this. Oh, okay. So Hitler uh, Hitler had done a lot up until this point to have total control mm -hmm. over Germany and over the state, whether it was controlling uh, what news went out to having people swear oaths of loyalty to him as a person, mm -hmm. not Germany. Like, it really hit me today, the Heil Hitler thing. Like, Soldiers saying Heil Hitler to one another when Hitler's not around. Right. It's not like I would understand if like, well, sure, you do that to Hitler. Mm -hmm. But he was having them do that to everyone. It wasn't like long live Germany. It was Heil Hitler. Right. And they're like, he's nowhere near here. You realize they're like, yeah, but we got to say this. Sure. Otherwise, we're toast. And I think over time, like even when you are forced to do that or kind of brainwashed into doing that or whatever, you kind of adopt that. That sense, like, yeah. like that eagerness, you know, it's, it's weird. <laughs> it's bizarre. It's, just, it's bizarre. It is bizarre. Um, the other thing we should mention really quickly too, before we move on, is the the Sippenhof. Uh, this was an ancient <clears throat> Middle Age uh, blood law, basically, where they say from Germany, where they were like, you know, if you're guilty of a crime, your whole family is. And as you will see, uh, Project Valkyrie was reason enough. For uh, for Himmler to dust that off, mm -hmm. say, remember that ancient custom? Mm -hmm. Well, we're just going to do it here. Yeah, it went even further back than that to like the second century B.C. from what I saw. It's crazy. So it's basically the idea is if you are a traitor, that means you have traitorous blood in you. And since you've passed your bloodline along, then all of the the members of your family must have that same traitorous blood, so the whole family has to be wiped out. That's the idea behind it. Man. It's not clear if Himmler just made this up or whatever, but there was that threat of of if you do something to um, put the family, in, to, to put yourself in jeopardy, you put the whole family in jeopardy. Well, yeah. It kept people, it, it, well, like, basically spying on not just their neighbors, yeah. but on their own family members. Yeah, and if you want to hatch a plot to kill Hitler, then that puts your family at risk. Exactly. Not just yourself. Yeah. And then plus also, um, the, the, it's, you can't really discount the fact that he really thoroughly controlled the media. So if there was a resistance, if there were people who did great acts of protest or whatever, it would just be lost. It would not be reported on. And so whatever spark they created couldn't grow into a flame. Yeah. So there was a, a tremendous amount of control. And even today, historians are still debating how complicit the, the actual people of Germany were and how much they were coerced into following Hitler. It's a, yeah. it's a real bone of contention among historians today. Well, I'm sure it was a very mixed bag of allegiances and loyalties and like what people truly believed and what they were – you know, they weren't getting the real information anyway, you know. Exactly. And then that on top of the whole family's going to get wiped out if you do something could keep people in line. All right. So Operation Valkyrie itself, like we said, killing Hitler was a small part. Well, not a small part, a major part 
But <laughs> Operation Valkyrie itself was a larger plan uh, to wrest control of of the German government, basically, from the, the Nazis and the SS. It, yeah, it was an existing operation that got co-opted yeah. and made a part of the plot to assassinate Hitler. Yeah, because they knew that just killing Hitler wasn't <laughs> enough. Because someone, uh, I guess Himmler would have just stepped in in his place. Yeah, there's evidence that Himmler knew about this plot and was basically letting it happen so he could take oh, sure. over. Of course. Treacherous. Uh, so uh, here was the deal. Operation Valkyrie was a contingency plan, and this was set up with Hitler's signature uh, to control the, the reserve army of Germany. So it was, there was basically, I couldn't tell if it was like our... Reserves over here? I don't know. It, it might I don't think not it was quite analog. like that because maybe they like were the active National, duty. Maybe like the National Guard. You think? Yeah, because it says that they were called up to um, to support uh, the front. And you call up the National Guard sometimes here in the United States. All right. Yeah, I think it would be like A the National comparison. Guard here. Yeah. Well, they were uh, the remnants of the German army that was left back. They were the army that was still in Germany at this point. Right. They weren't out fighting and on the front lines, they although were, they could be called. They were there to defend Germany. Yeah, exactly. So uh, if the call came through and Operation Valkyrie was enacted, that basically meant that something's gone wrong. and Not necessarily that Hitler's dead, but um, something's gone wrong and that army needs to mobilize, basically, yeah. and keep it the status quo until they hear further. And there were two people who were who were authorized to start uh, Operation Valkyrie, which was essentially a signal, like you said, that something's gone wrong mm-hmm. and the army needs to regain control of the country. Um, it was uh, Hitler and Friedrich Fromm, yeah. who was the army uh, reserve army leader. And... Um, if Frome basically said to the reserve army, Operation Valkyrie is in effect, the reserve army would fight whoever Frome told them to. Which is Tom Wilkinson, if you're playing at home. Man, <laughs> that guy, mwah. Oh, he's great. Great actor. He had this English accent in full effect here. <laughs> Did he? Tom Cruise is speaking American. It's all over the map. Oh, it's crazy. It was a weird decision. Lots of weird decisions. It was at the time, I mean, have you seen it? I, I started to and then stopped. <laughs> Yeah? Yeah. It was, I thought it was a good movie, but... I'm sure it was. I don't know. I don't remember what it was, but I just couldn't. I know that, that Brian Singer, the, the director, made the conscious choice. He was like, I don't want everyone doing these bad German accents. So everybody do different weird accents. So just talk how you talk. And it's a little confusing. Yeah. I mean, not confusing because you know they're Germans because mm-hmm. they're wearing those fantastic outfits. <laughs> By Hugo Boss. <laughs> Is that true? Yes. I heard that he was... Co-opted, but not didn't actually design the uniforms. Uh, I think it's probably like the um, Adidas, the Danzler brothers. Remember yeah. their factory was co-opted to make torpedoes? Gotcha. I'm pretty sure the same thing happened, but Hugo Boss's thing was to make the, the uniforms. Oh, okay. Um, so, yeah, I think it's true. I just wondered if he actually designed them. I, that's what I heard. That's what Russell Brand says. And by God, <laughs> if there's ever been a truth teller, it's that guy. So uh, Treskow, Kenneth Branagh, like I was saying, he was the one that was really um, opposed to the brutality of Nazism, and he's the one that uh, developed these uh, amendments to Operation Valkyrie for this plan, which, from what I could tell, was basically to speed everything up a lot because they they had a limited amount of time yeah. once they killed Hitler to pull this off, and I think it was like – Operation Valkyrie was supposed to be six or eight hours, and he was like, no, we need to get this done in like two or three. So those are the amendments that he created? I think so, in addition to some other stuff, but I think it was speed mainly. All right, which is ironic because it actually got slowed down in, in, the, in the execution. Yeah. Um, but the, So again, just to restate, because it is a little confusing. Operation Valkyrie was an existing Nazi plan or German army plan. Yeah for the reserve army, the National Guard, back home in Germany to take control of the country um, in in the event Operation Valkyrie was enacted. And that could be because there was an uprising in a, in a concentration camp. It could be that there was some sort of revolt. The, this, if Whatever it was, it was an official Nazi German military plan that existed that got co-opted by the assassination <laughs> plotters yes. to tailor it so that they could use it 
in a conjunction with assassinating Hitler. Yes. And basically trick the reserve army into doing their bidding. And everyone, that's three times now. If you don't get it now, just go listen to something else. Okay. Go listen to Friendly Fire. He's talking to me, everybody. He wants me to stop <laughs> explaining it. Will there be a fourth time? Who knows? Okay. So, uh, well, I guess we need to talk a little bit about Tom Cruise, who was sort of the main player in this assassination attempt. Yeah, we got to talk a lot about him. This is the guy who was who's become a national um, hero in Germany. Yeah, and he, here's the deal: like history, and certainly that film painted him as a as a hero. I mean, he was a tried and true Nazi mm-hmm. um, up in you know up to a point where he decided to kill Hitler. But he was not some, like, great guy who was always like, no, I think what we're doing is wrong, guys. Right. We should really rethink this. His brother was – his brother Berthold – am I pronouncing that correctly? Ber- B-E-R-T-H-O-L-D? Yeah. Okay. His brother Berthold, his older brother, um, was in this plot too. And he actually was um, tortured and uh, gave a confession and apparently in his confession, he said, you know, no, we generally agree with what the Nazis are doing. We just think Hitler is a little too um, uh, over eager, overzealous about yeah. spilling German blood uh, and trying to conquer the world. But everything else we pretty much agree with. So, yeah, these guys were they were Nazis. They yeah. were just anti Hitler, basically. Yeah. So um, Klaus von Stauffenberg had been uh, wounded previously, uh, I think, in Africa, right? Uh, yes, under Rommel. Yeah, and was um, – in fact, that scene in the film is really good. It's pretty accurate. His his There's a bombing and a, and a strafing from a plane that he gets like full on all over his body, loses his uh, right hand and everything but two fingers and his thumb on his left, <clears throat> loses his left eye, mm-hmm. and is uh, – basically he's got – Two functioning fingers and a thumb. Yeah. At this point. Yes. Not the perfect person to carry out a very highly technical bomb planting. Yeah, and that's definitely going to come into play. But apparently, um, Stauffenberg, Klaus Stauffenberg said, you know, enough of this, like people losing their nerve, Quantro bombs not going off. I mean, come on. If you want it done it right, just do it yourself is basically apparently what his policy was. So he said, I'll do it. I'll kill Hitler. Yeah, he never said, maybe I should just shoot him in the head. Yeah, well, he wanted to live as evidenced by the actual plot that they came up with. Well, plus they also wanted um, – not wanted, they they sort of demanded uh, that, that Himmler be in the room – at the time and also be taken out. Right. Otherwise, what's the point? Right. So this July 20th plot that we're working up to was actually could have been called like the, I think, July 2nd plot or the July 8th plot. There were like a few different attempts that were aborted. And one of them was because Himmler and Goering, I believe, were were meant to be in the room with Hitler. Yeah. Yeah. And they weren't, so they called it off. But right. apparently Klaus Strausberg decided on his own. He Klaus was gonna, von Straufenberg? Straufenberg. <laughs> I keep wanting to say Strausberg. Um, Straufenberg decided on his own he was going to kill Hitler anyway. And when he went back in the room to do it after reporting that that Himmler and Goering weren't there yeah. um, to kill Hitler, uh, Hitler had just left. The meeting ended early. Yeah. Like that that was the kind of like luck that Hitler had. Yeah, and that was played out pretty accurately in the movie actually. Um Like, he was like, all right, I'm going to do it. And they're like, "Uh, meeting's adjourned. (laughs) He said, wait, wait. (laughs) I have something else to say. Um, Just to kind of reset who who the major or what the major players are doing, uh, we mentioned Frederick Frome, uh, Tom Wilkinson in the movie. He was the head of the Reserve Army. And then there was another key player named uh, Friedrich Ulbricht, um, who was – he was the one that basically was – because Frome was like – I kind of know about this, but I'm not. I'm, I'm not going to play a part in it. Right. But I'm not going to rat you out either. So I'm just going to see where the chips fall. Exactly. Very cowardly. Yeah. He would. He would have basically gone with whoever was in charge. Yeah. Or whoever was on top. So he wouldn't report it, but he also wouldn't sign the order himself, which meant that Ulbricht had to actually issue a fake order in Fromm's name. Uh, Mobilizing that, you know, basically Operation Valkyries in effect. Right. So Ulbricht, Fromm, and uh, Stauffenberg were all Reserve Army high officials. Mm -hmm. And again, the Reserve Army is the one who can take control of the country under Operation Valkyrie. (laughs) 
<laughs> we should have a uh, a sound effect. <laughs> Every time we explain that. Well, maybe Jerry will surprise us. Um, all right. Should we talk about uh, the actual day? On July 20th? Yeah. I think we should. All right. So Hitler is in the Wolf Slayer. That's where he spent. It was, mm-hmm. um, I guess it would have been Poland, huh? Yeah. East Prussia, which is part of Poland. Yeah. So that was where he was hanging out toward the end of the war. Heavily fortified. Heavily on meth. Well, that would actually make a lot of sense because he was increasingly paranoid. Yes, that's. I think that's part of the evidence. Locked in a bunker doing meth. That probably doesn't help. (laughs) In East Prussia. Yeah. (laughs) They call it the East Prussia Blues. So, uh, the, I guess it's called the, the Wolf, uh, the Wolf Schanze in German, but the Wolf Slayer. Give it some flavor. The Wolf Schanze. There you go. (laughs) Um, but just very heavily fortified, like, his actual bunker and area was like concrete uh-huh. with like steel doors. Mm-hmm. It was where that where you would keep Hitler at that point in the war, right? Or where Hitler would keep himself. Yeah. So there was on this July twentieth plot. There again, they wanted Himmler and um, Gehring, if not Goebbels too, uh, in the room with Hitler. Well, Himmler was the big one they wanted, right? Because yeah. he was the 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 heir apparent, right? Yeah. But if you'll notice. As many times as they they tried to do this, um, Himmler was nowhere around Hitler at this time. Yeah. Which is, again, evidence that Himmler knew something was up and wasn't about to be in the same room as Hitler at any point because he, they knew that, he knew that they wanted to kill Hitler and take him out, too. Right. So he was just going to let it play out. So they decided to just go ahead and assassinate Hitler, at least. And this wolf slayer was a perfect location to assassinate Hitler if it was an inside job. Like yeah. you said, you could not get to him in there from the outside. Mm-hmm. But if you could get in, you could get to him really well because these concrete reinforced bunkers with steel doors that had no windows. Yeah. If you set off a bomb in there, it would be amplified. Mm-hmm. It would have the 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 concussion from the bomb, the blast, the shock wave would have nowhere to go. So it would just reverberate around the room until it finally went out of steam. Yeah. And it would kill Everybody in there, yeah. no matter where you were, no matter what you were doing, you would be dead from this blast. Yep. So it was a really good idea when they showed up on July 20th, Stauffenberg and his assistant uh, with two briefcases that each had a time bomb in it with two pounds of plastic explosives. One of those would have killed everybody. They had double the amount. Yeah, and the guy that set this all up in the, in the movie basically said that. He was like, this is pretty redundant to have two of these. Uh-huh. He was like, in that bunker, one of these will kill everyone in that room. Right. Um, like, don't sweat it, guys. Nothing can go wrong. <laughs> yeah. Even though you have to stick this metal thing in there and crack it with a pair of pliers. Uh-huh. And I notice you've only got two fingers, but this should be fine. <laughs> Um, nothing can go wrong. <laughs> what went wrong was something that no one anticipated is that meeting, and this changed everything, mm-hmm. uh, that meeting didn't take place in the bunker, supposedly because it was too hot. Too hot. Hitler didn't like to sweat. And he was loaded on meth. So, right. So they moved this this meeting where they were going to go over strategy, like detailed strategy, maps and everything, from this death-inducing bunker yeah. to basically a hut, a flimsy hut, almost open air. It was so flimsy. It had yeah. windows and everything. No, I think the windows were open, too, because it was hot. Okay. Um, the roof was just kind of like whatever. It might as well have been thatched. And then the the uh, room also featured a table, a heavy slab oak table with heavy oaken legs, and that's what they had the maps out on. That yeah. was a this will be a big deal in a second. Yeah. So the plan is we we go in there. We uh, they were going to fake like he needed to change his shirt because he got some blood from cutting his neck while shaving. Stauffenberg. Yeah. Okay. And so uh, that's where he would get some private time to. Um, to activate the bomb, he knew he would have, you know, 10 minutes, maybe less to get out of there uh, once he did that. So uh, they, they they did so. They broke these capsules, um, went in there, and the plan was that he was going to have it set up where uh, he had someone faking a call coming mm-hmm. in to get him out of the room in which he would say, I got to get to Berlin. Right. I got orders. Like, I got to leave now. And Hitler would be like, uh, I give the orders here. Who told you to go to Berlin? <laughs> well, Hitler wouldn't know about any of this. He's uh, okay. knee deep in uh, pounding tables and yelling. 
So um, they have the they have the two briefcases. They they only get a chance because as they're um, cutting open the acid capsule on the one, I guess a sentry outside like uh, called through the door to him, scared him. Yeah, they were like, "Hey, dude, the meeting's starting." Okay, so they had to head out. That was another thing. The meeting time changed from one to twelve thirty because yeah. Mussolini was coming, and they wanted to make sure they were done in time for his arrival. Right. Okay. <laughs> so um, they only got to activate one of the bombs, and they just left the other one. They didn't take it in with them. They just kept it with them. Yeah. So they were down to one bomb. They were in a different venue than the bomb had been planned for, and then now this heavy oak table comes into into play. Yeah, so while they were in there, they set it down near Hitler, uh, or, you know, Stauffenberg does. Um, a man named Heinz Brandt um, went and stepped close to the table so he could see things better, mm. knocked over the briefcase, <laughs> and it's just so like, are you kidding me? Yeah. With, like, how history plays out. Yeah. He, if he hadn't have kicked over that thing, it might have still worked. Yeah. Uh, but he kicked over the briefcase, moved it to the other side of one of those big heavy oak legs. Uh, mm. The bomb does go off. And Stauffenberg gets the heck out of there quick, like. Right. And in his mind, he's like, that bomb, that explosion was massive. Like, everyone's dead. Yeah. And and we're gone. He and his assistant. Yeah. So he heads out from the Wolf's Lair to a waiting airplane at the nearby airbase to fly back to Berlin and start Operation Valkyrie. Right. That's where we're going to leave it for now. Yeah. We'll be back right after this. Okay, Chuck, so Stauffenberg's just set off this bomb. He and his assistant are on their way to Berlin, right? Yeah, three-hour flight, Mm -hmm. and while he's in the air, Valkyrie is supposed to have started. Right, but here's the problem. There was a guy stationed at the Wolf Slayer who was meant to report on this Mm -hmm. and basically say, go ahead, do your thing, Operation Valkyrie's a a go, Hitler's dead. Yeah. But they hadn't considered that Hitler might survive this assassination attempt, yeah. didn't come up with any code word for that. So the guy was just kind of clumsily like <laughs> trying to be like, you know, things aren't so great. Um, uh, Something big happened, but not, not happened, that happened. big. Right. <laughs> so, so they were like, we don't know what you're talking about. Because pre- people are listening, basically. Sure. Yeah. So um, they, they, the guys back in Berlin, these assassination plotters, these conspirators, get this message from the Wolf Slayer, and they still don't know what's going on. They just know something has happened. They don't know if Hitler's dead or what. So the guy, is it Ulbricht, who decides to wait until Stauffenberg comes back yeah. to enact Operation Valkyrie. So there's a three-hour delay between the bomb going off and the implementation of Operation Valkyrie. Yeah, and if you'll recall back at the beginning, they <clears throat> sped this whole thing up by three hours in the official plans that Hitler signed off on. Mm-hmm. So timing was important. Right. So when Tom Cruise lands, he's like, dude, are you kidding me? Right. That was three hours ago. Right. So um, that was that was a big problem with it. A second problem was is that they didn't cut the lines from the Wolf Slayer. And apparently even Goebbels like mocked them later after this. They like didn't even cut the telephone lines. Yeah, they didn't cut them. They ceased communications. <laughs> they tried to as yeah. best they could, but they didn't have control of the Wolf Slayer. They just could all they could do is kind of clumsily mess up the the communications to delay it. Yeah. But there was no radio silence from the Wolf Slayer which would have let Operation Valkyrie play out. Instead, Germany had a lot of conflicting reports oh, man. and different things going chaos. on. It was total chaos. Is Hitler alive? Is Hitler dead? Um, who's in charge? And so when when Stauffenberg gets back and finds out Albrecht has been waiting, sitting on Operation Valkyrie, he immediately is like, put it into, into play. Mm-hmm. It's going. Um, w- one way or another. We don't know if Hitler's dead or not, but we're going ahead with Operation Valkyrie because no one knows if Hitler's dead or not, so we could conceivably pull it off. Yeah, and I think there were, um, I think it was like Paris, Prague, maybe Vienna, were some of the strongholds where they needed these people to get on board and start, you know, gathering up the SS. Uh, In Paris, 
the uh, quartermaster of the German troops there did receive the message, right. set the coup in motion. I think it might have happened in Prague, but, like, things were happening. Yeah. But Berlin was the big one because they knew, like, even if they got Paris and the others, like, fully on board and, and finished, you know, with their duties, mm-hmm. if they didn't have Berlin, they were still kind of screwed. Right. So they – um they actually didn't have Berlin. It was kind of like a seesaw, whether they were going to have Berlin or not. Yeah. Um, there was enough confusion that I think the guy who was in charge of the reserve army at the time um, didn't know which way to go. From? Well, yeah. From <clears throat> was the sort of coward that was just, he just wanted to not get ratted out. Right. He just wanted things to turn out well for him. So he um, he he sees a chance to basically realign himself with Hitler. Yeah, because it's clear that the or it looks like the coup is probably not going to work. Mm-hmm. So his allegiance is back to Hitler, and so he he tries to arrest uh, Stauffenberg and Obricht, and they in turn arrest him. And there's apparently a shootout right in the actual War Ministry building. Yeah, because there were uh, mm-hmm. literally. Diff, two different sets of orders, official orders coming out. Right. Because there were, because of miscommunication, there were two different people controlling the German army well, finally, and the German government. Right. And so finally, there was a guy who was truly confused. One of the reserve army leaders was genuinely confused. He he was trying to follow orders because he thought that there was an SS uprising, like uh, the Operation Valkyrie plotters had said. Yeah. And apparently, uh, he got on the phone with Hitler, and Hitler <laughs> said, do you recognize my voice? Oh, yeah, man. <laughs> and the guy was like, uh, yeah. He goes, I'm telling you to arrest these people, that the Nazis are still in charge, and to disregard these other orders. I want to send more crystal mass. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Supply is low. <laughs> uh, and, and here's the deal. Hitler had ordered, um, he wanted them taken alive. Um, whereas Fromm was trying to speed up their execution mm-hmm. so he wouldn't get ratted out. Uh, and basically, and, and I think this is kind of true how it played out in the movie, um, Schaffenberg is like, you're going down too. Like, you realize this. Right. Like, nobody will be spared. Right. So you're kidding yourself if you think this kangaroo court you're going to run us through is going to make any difference. Right. So Fromm said, oh, okay, well, then I'll just have you guys summarily executed. Yeah. That's and, what, what he did. Yeah, this court— um, it's sort of the definition of a kangaroo court in history. Uh, it was called the People's Court, which is kind of funny. <laughs> there was no Judge Wapner no. hanging out. There was a Judge Freisler, though, um, and there's actually footage of this guy. He had this really shrill voice, and he would – this was a court where you would run people in and just have a 100 percent chance – of, like, conviction by hanging or firing squad. Yeah, it was uh, run by um, Nazi fanatics, and it was a court designed to try people who resisted Nazism. Yeah, and the the Sippenhoff that we mentioned, that all your family's guilty too, Mm -hmm. this was really where it got enacted uh, the heaviest. And I think, like, 7,000 people were arrested in this plot. 7,000 people were arrested, 5,000 were executed. Man. So they really went to town on that Sippenhoff thing. Um, they they uh, took babies, infants, and yeah. put them in concentration camp oh, yeah. for, for children under 16. Um, the uh, Stauffenberg brothers. So <clears throat> from summarily executed Klaus Stauffenberg that night at the war ministry. Mm-hmm. Um, and something I saw that I thought was kind of cool. His assistant jumped in front of the bullets yeah. originally intended for Stauffenberg, and then they still killed Stauffenberg anyway. Sure. But Fromm was trying to cover up his tracks. It didn't work. Fromm was among the executed at this later kangaroo court, right? Yeah, I think he was executed in March. <clears throat> and a- as part of this, this Sippenhoff, it was just basically, if there had been any restraints whatsoever on Hitler and the Nazis in Germans, or Germany— um, which you could really make the case like, nah, there really weren't. But if there were, they were off now. Mm-hmm. And once Hitler realized that this was part of a larger plot, he went berserk, and it just became a blood orgy for him, just killing everybody, anyone he yeah. could find that might have anything remotely to do with this plot he killed. He killed people who'd been prisoners for years. He went through and did another purge of people who uh, had just been in prison you know, for maybe thinking of assassinating him years back. Yeah. Totally unrelated. Um, 
they were just as the the allies started to move in and the Russians started to move in, they started killing people in the concentration camps, just stepping it up even more. Unbelievable. It, it, and there's a there's a really good possibility that a lot of those people would have lived had that bomb worked, had it killed Hitler. Oh, sure. Um, there's a there the 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 idea that there were people waiting to negotiate a peace immediately, mm-hmm. a surrender of Germany. Um, all, all those people who died after July 20th, 1944 would have lived. Yeah. Uh, I think some of them were offered the opportunity to take their own life, mm-hmm. which quite a few of them did. Uh, like literally like, here's a gun. Just go in the other room. So Rommel's a very famous example of that. Yeah. I think, did he cyanide himself? He was given, he was given the opportunity to take a cyanide pill. Um, some Gestapo guys came to his house and said, here's how it is. If you were a national hero, if you if it comes out that you were part of this plot, mm-hmm. people are going to start questioning Hitler and Nazism. So we can't have that. We're going to give you the opportunity to kill yourself, and we won't make your family part of this Sippenhof. We'll leave your family alone. Right. So he chose to take his own life rather than um, rather than let his family go through this and and be court martialed and executed anyway. Yeah. So he killed himself uh, as a as a uh, from this plot. Yeah, so there was a cyanide, there was gunshots uh, uh, that you put upon yourself, there were firing squad, and then there was the, the meat hook hanging, mm-hmm. which was um, Hitler would require that certain of these people had wire tied around their throat, mm-hmm. and then that was hung from a meat hook. And um, Bertold uh, von Stauffenberg was one of those guys. Oh, von Stauffenberg's brother? <clears throat> yes. Oh, wow. He was um, He was strangled multiple times and revived so that they could strangle him again. Yeah. And Hitler, the whole thing was filmed for Hitler to watch later. Jeez. So, yeah, it was, uh, it, it, he went berserk. After that, apparently, if you went to go visit Hitler, you, um, even as one of his loyal, like, uh, Nazi military uh, yeah. officials, you had to leave your gun outside. Yeah, I think that might have been a rule anyway because, or maybe it was just tradition, to leave your your sidearm <clears throat> and you know outside the room, um, because they were doing that in the movie. Oh, really? Yeah, but you know, I think on Roderick's show he was like, "Well, you could stick a gun in your pocket." Yeah, in your little garter. Yeah, wherever in your sock garter. Sure, or your <laughs> thigh garter. <laughs> yeah, depending on what you're into. Sure. Um, I think that's it. I'm surprised they didn't go after because. Uh, Von Strassenberg's family was not punished. Like his wife died like 10 or 12 years ago. Right. But she was sent to a concentration camp yeah. and was liberated from it after the, after the war. But they, I mean, she went to a concentration camp for sure. His brother. I can't believe they weren't, he and his, her and her kids weren't killed though. I'm surprised Like on too. the spot. Yeah. It's weird. Apparently the arbitrariness just increased the terror of it too. Oh. You know? Well, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeesh. So uh, that is the July 20th plot. Okay, to assassinate Hitler. Uh, if you want to know more about that, go listen to the um, uh, the uh, Friendly Fire episode on it. Yeah, it's a good one. And Hitler, by the way, he <clears throat> he was gone. I think nine months later. Right. So it wasn't. Uh, I mean, well, this is toward the end anyway. But... Which makes it even worse. Yeah. You know. All right. So uh, if you uh, already said that, it means it's time for listener mail. So a quick follow-up on administrative details. We said if we forgot someone, uh, and Lawson Barney wrote in, and I did forget this one. Um, I sent an early color study of my Pando painting and wanted to make sure it arrived. It's about three by five inches in yeah. an envelope. Yes. And it did, and it's wonderful and lovely, and very sorry, Lawson, for that sneaking bias. Uh, I also want to say I got something from Allison Gallagher as well. Oh, nice. I hadn't realized it. So thank you, Allison, for my gifts, too. Nice. It wasn't just Chuck that you sent stuff to. And you can uh, find Lawson's art at uh, LawsonBarneyArt.com. Yeah, it's beautiful painting. Very nice. All right, listener mail. <laughs> this is uh, well, this is a very sweet, uh, sweet email from a couple. Okay. Hey, guys, Rodney, thank you for always being uh, there on our long car rides. My wife, Mia, and I have to travel 12 hours from our home in Butte, Montana uh, to Salt Lake City for her cancer treatment at Huntsman Cancer Institute every couple of months. And learning something new from you guys is always a welcome addition on our drive. I thought of her type of cancer uh, and the treatment uh, as an interesting idea for an episode. She was diagnosed with a rare cancer called uh, 
neuroendocrine tumor, NET. Uh, it's on her pancreas, uh, but it's very different from pancreatic cancer. So when Steve uh, Jobs and Aretha Franklin um, pass of this type of cancer, it's always reported in the news as pancreatic cancer, which is incorrect and very disappointing because hmm. it does take away awareness from NET cancer. Uh, the treatment is called peptide receptor radionuclide therapy. It works in a way that sounds like science fiction. Uh, the treatment is done through IV and is combined in two parts. One part is attracted to cancer cells and is welcomed into the cell. The second part is attached to the first and releases a small amount of radiation when inside the cancer cells. Wow. Very fascinating, and my explanation is very much glossed over. Uh, again, thank you for the show. Last thing, can you give my wife, Mia, a shout-out? Nice. And that is from Bo Miller. So, of course, Mia. Hey, Mia. Shout out to Mia. Yeah. Hang in there, guys. I know it's a very tough time for you, and I'm glad we can help in some small way while you're making these long car rides. Yep. Yep. And we'll look into NET for sure. Yep. And thank you for reaching out to us, too. If you want to reach out to us, you can find us on StuffYouShouldKnow.com. All of our social links are on there. And uh, you can also send us an email to StuffPodcast at HowStuffWorks.com. and thousands of other topics, visit HowStuffWorks.com.